Hey everybody, good morning, it's Jamie. Um, and of course we're here at 9.30, like we are every day, which what it seems like uh, decades at this point, but really it's only been a couple months, but it's been a, a great couple months, few months of getting to bring on people, have conversations, learn more about what is going to stabilize our industry, learn about each other, help each other, um, doing all the things that I know that we know how to do best as pet care providers and doing it with each other is really, I think, um, really speaks volumes for who we are and who we want to be in the future. Speaking of future, <clears throat> um, today I have another guest, uh, Mr. Neil Stern. As you can see the banner below, um, Neil is an attorney um, who specializes in employment law. And as we all know, that is a very hot topic in our industry, has been since the 90s and continues to be so. And given the fact that folks are receiving some funding to support payroll and other operational practices, we thought would be a great time to just have a conversation, bring an expert on, let you guys ask questions. I'm gonna let Neil do his thing. So I'm gonna step back, let Neil run the show. He's gonna go, I told him he can go, Neil, you can go to like 10, whatever, a half hour. He's got downloads, he's got information, he's awesome, he's a lawyer of one of our clients, he's Chicago-based, whoop. <clears throat> and, uh, and so Neil, hi, good morning. Morning. Um, Thank you for being here, I'm really psyched. I feel like people are gonna love everything you have to say, uh, or they'll hate it, but either way, I, they'll love I, it. My pleasure, and I will warn you that I am just relentlessly positive, <laughs> even in the face of just lots of things to feel really negative about like well, the one thing i've tried to maintain through all of this is the notion that eventually this will either end or we will come to grips with whatever the new normal represents or something in between yeah. and that the business owners and service providers such as myself who you know who are going to survive and thrive are the ones who figure out like how to manage this and there are also, and there, and there are, you know, not to say that there's a silver lining in all this because this is the whole situation is just beyond awful. But if you want to look for a silver lining, one of the silver linings is that for those of us who do survive, there are going to be opportunities because the the, the entrepreneurs who who aren't as successful in figuring this out aren't going, you know, or don't want to, or just give up won't be around. So there's, you know, there, there may be even more of a market for our services, depending upon how you market yourself, you may uh, find yourself in new markets simply by, ne by necessity. Yep. Uh, for, you know, for, you know, for example, for myself, uh, you know, when this whole thing struck, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. I started figuring out, okay, well, who am I going to I, I started aggressively marketing myself to chambers of commerce, which I'd never really done before. All of a sudden, I've become like the COVID go-to guy for chambers of commerce around the Chicago area. And I can tell you how many clients I've gotten out of that. I never, I probably wouldn't have thought of that if I hadn't been forced into it by all this awfulness. Uh, so there are potential. Well, actually, well, and in the pet service business, as you now know, because you have been getting involved in pet service businesses, there's really a million things that people can do. It, once you've made yourself um, a part of someone's family or service team, there's many things you can do, whether it's food delivery, whether it's um, you know other other household services, contracting with other folks. I mean, once you're once you're trusted, you're trusted. Um, and frankly, just one thing, I'm going to go ahead and say this, and then I'm going to really give give the floor to you. You know, Neil, I know I told you this, but this group of entrepreneurs, the 300 to 400 folks that we have here in our group, these are the best of the best. They represent the best because they're doing two things. Number one, they're staying involved and connected with the rest of their industry through information gathering like this. But also they're using our platform just to train their employees or their 1099s, which, of course, is a great way to bring it to you. But these are these do represent. And I was saying to Neil earlier, guys, I've been watching some other groups and people have been reporting back to me. Not cool. People are freaking out on each other, saying that nice things. We don't do that here. <clears throat> Our fetch fine world is um, positive and helpful and supportive. And I think the reason we haven't had those issues here is because we do represent the Fetch Fine subscribers do represent the best of the best. Un unbelievably so, Un un unequivocally for years, it's always been the case. So you've got a great audience. Um, everybody, I'm so happy that Neil has had 
uh, who's flexible because of my internet issues last week and some that were happening this morning. And I'm just so glad that he's here. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Neil. Just so you know, I'm going to go ahead. I'll be here, of course, and I'll sort of change the things on the screen. I'll also interrupt you very kindly, yet probably a little bit on the rude side when people have questions, because I don't want you, you don't need to worry about looking at Facebook. I'll moderate, I'll check things out, but I'm gonna go ahead and step back now. I give the floor to you, Mr. Stern. Um, thank you so much. I just wanna say, really grateful that you're here. This is gonna be awesome. And uh, yeah, you're, you're a really kind guy. Okay, I'm stepping out. Okay, I love, I love doing this kind of thing. Uh, so, Everybody who's watching this, you, you almost certainly, I mean, you know that the, the, the general topic is independent contractor versus W-2 status. And so if you chose to watch this, uh, uh, it means you're in one of three categories. You're either, uh, you, all of your, either you have all of your people as W-2s, you have all of them as independent contractors, or you're some combination thereof. And you might be in a state where you've been shut down and you're thinking about getting, uh, you know, getting up and going again. Maybe, you know, you, you're running, but you're, you know, at kind of a low ebb and you're hoping to, to ramp up going forward. But regardless, this is really the ideal time. And I made this comment on the um, Facebook feed, uh, the, uh, the, the Facebook page, that this is really the ideal time to be looking at all of your employee related issues, not just classification of employees, which as we'll talk about today is extremely important, but all of your policies, your, your compensation levels, your compensation systems, whether you use incentive pay, do you pay by the hour, do you pay salary, uh, uh, you know, what, are your, what are your leave policies, what kinds of benefits do you offer, do you require your people to sign uh, non-solicitation agreements, all of those issues, this is the ideal time to be looking at it because it's you can it's very easy to change this stuff before you hire someone or before you bring them back if they've been uh, furloughed. It's very difficult, as I'm sure you can imagine, for many reasons, to change these things once someone's already working for you. So this is really the perfect time to be talking about all of these issues. So that being said, let's hone in on the question of 1099s versus uh, W-2s. And again, if, you, if you're using all W-2 people, maybe you're wondering, well, am I doing the right thing? Uh, you're looking for some validation or you're feeling uh, that it's unfair that you're competing with people who aren't doing that and you wonder what to do about that. On the other hand, if you're using 1099s, you're worried, well, am I, am I doing something wrong? Are there, are there potential legal issues out there? Uh, what would be involved in actually switching over? And the, or maybe then you have a hybrid situation, believe it or not, I've seen uh, uh, employers where they basically, someone comes to work for them and they ask them, do you prefer to be W-2 or 1099? Or maybe they tell them you're gonna be W-2 and the person says, well, I don't wanna be W-2, I only wanna work in a 1099, I don't wanna have withholding. And then you really want this person, so you say, okay. And the question is, you know, what, you know, what does that mean for you as, as a uh, business owner? Uh, there are, uh, unexpectedly, there are reasons to be very, even more concerned about this issue now than before. I mean, this has always been a concern. I mean, I've been talking about it for years that, um, that employers who, who are using 1099 workers where there's a, a at least a potential issue that they might be W to considered legally uh, W-2 employees. Uh, you know, I've been talking about these risks for years, but these risks have actually increased very recently uh, for a couple of unexpected, one expected and one unexpected reason. The expected reason is that any time uh, employees become uh, financially insecure, unemployment goes up, it's harder to find a job, uh, the likelihood of litigation immediately increases because people are people are desperate for money and they're more receptive to, uh, to being told by friends that they could file a charge and maybe get some money up, out of their employer, uh, that maybe they talk to a plaintiff's attorney who, who, and they're more receptive to the idea of, of suing because they, they're desperate, they need the money. An unhappy employee uh, in good times 
Well, they leave and they have another job the next day. Now, if they're unemployed for another six months, well, they have plenty of time to sit around thinking of ways to go after their former employee employer, namely you. So that's the kind of expected uh, risk. The unexpected risk comes from a, an interesting direction, which is that under the, the, the CARES Act, the, one of the many uh, coronavirus relief acts that were passed, for the first time pretty much ever, independent contractors are now able to file for unemployment. And they have been, as I'm sure you know, they've been filing for unemployment in droves. But what that means is that the, uh, the various state agencies and unemployment, as you probably know, is, is, a, is handled at the state level, although the federal government has been uh, helping states out and reimbursing states for certain unemployment obligations. It's, it's administered, uh, run, and determinations are made at the state level. So every, every state has its own rules. But in every state that I'm aware of, uh, this is the, really the first time that they've been been awarding uh, unemployment to independent contractors, and as a result, they are these agencies are developing a database of a massive database of independent contractors who are claiming unemployment. And what's happening, and I happen to know for a fact that this is going on in several states, and I suspect it's going on in a lot of states, is that. Uh, is that the state agencies are identifying industries where they believe there is a, there is a widespread practice of misclassification of, of employees being treated as, as 1099 contractors. Their motivation for doing that is fairly obvious. There are, there's just a lot of money out there to be made by the states and the states are desperate for money. And I'll talk in a few minutes about, about you know, where that money might be coming from and what it's based on. But you, you can safely assume that these state agencies are highly motivated to go after companies who are misclassifying their employees. And the easiest thing for them to do is to identify a particular industry. For example, I know of one state where they're very focused on home health care aids. Uh, I know of several states where they are, in fact, focused on the, on pet care, in, on the pet care industry because uh, historically, both at the federal and, and state level, there is a perception among these agencies that, that, that dog walkers in particular and pet sitters as well just don't meet the test for an independent contractor. Historically, that hasn't been that big an issue because the likelihood of anyone getting audited has been pretty slim. Uh, all I'm suggesting now is that the likelihood of getting audited is is ramping up significantly. I mean, uh, this happened in uh, New York City some years ago, where, uh, and I happened to be living in New York at the time, so I had I saw this firsthand how uh, nail salons were routinely uh, treating their employees as independent contractors and not paying them overtime or minimum wage. And they all felt safe doing that because everyone was doing it. You know, they figured, well, they can't shut down the entire industry. Well, guess what? <laughs> the New York Department of Labor decided one day, we're not going to allow this to go on. Uh, and they swooped in and they just started auditing these nail salons right and left. Some of them were getting hit with out of the blue with six figure liability and a whole bunch of them went out of business in a hurry. Uh, and I think we're going to see some waves of that, you know, whether that happens to the pet care industry, like who knows? But I think it is the the likelihood of that happening is ramped up significantly, and I think you are doing yourself and your people a disservice by not at least taking a very serious look at this issue if you are employing pet sitters, walkers, you know those types of people as uh, as independent contractors. Uh, you feel your saving money and in the short term you know just in pure cash flow you know you are certainly saving some money uh the question is are the the potential liabilities you're incurring uh you know, to what extent do they outweigh it? and i can tell you and i'm going to talk about it now with some more specificity well, that those liabilities can a question sorry yeah. i interrupt for one minute because i know that there are people who have you know, been asking this question about 
learning about this now. So you've owned a business, you've had 1099s or a hybrid of 1099s and W2s, and you're and now you realize that it's time to make the change because of all of the things that you're sharing right now and other reasons. Are are people less are business owners less likely to be audited? Or would the penalty be lesser if they were to make the change, even though they may have been um, uh, challenging the law for some period of time leading up to making that conversion? Or, or, or will there be more leniency? Will there be will, will audits not happen if you do make the change? Just you know, sort of playing with the idea today versus never, or versus never. Yeah, versus yeah. never. Yeah, I mean, there are there are a variety of approaches to take, and the answer to that question is going to vary significantly depending on whether, for example, are you is it the IRS that's auditing you? Okay. Is it the is it a state Department of Employment Security that's auditing you? Is it state taxation? I mean, every agency yeah. is going to have its have its own approach to this. Uh, the IRS actually has uh, a program. Where you where you can where you can apply for uh, for advice about whether your people are or are not. What's that program called? I want to go ahead and let people know. Uh, that I think I. Were you added? I, I, I had I I have a link right. in my uh, in the document that I gave you that we're giving to people. Okay, yeah, they sort of my, my employer alert in okay. that document. There's a link to the IRS uh, page that talks about all the that all these issues. But the number one thing to think about is that is that the minute you make the change, you stop the clock ticking. Okay. So, and, so you know, maybe one of our one of our subscribers just asked a very specific question. I'm gonna read it verbatim. Is it a red flag? And I think you just answered this, but I want to make sure I'm really clear. Is it a red flag to convert mid-year? So now, for example. Uh a great question. I think yes. I I I don't I don't think that that I mean th that's something you might want to actually talk to your CPA about. You know, just like for years, CPAs used to tell you, well, you know, don't apply for a home office exemption because you know it increases the likelihood of getting audited. Right. And then sometime in the past few years, they stopped saying that because I mean they've got their fingers on the pulse of the IRS and they know what the IRS is up to. So I think that might be more of your tax professional. Question, but what I can tell you is that every day that you are treating people as 1099s who, who legally should be W-2s, you know, that, that, that clock is ticking. And generally speaking, the statute of, statute of limitations, this is a very common question too, is well, how far back can they go? Generally speaking, it's three years, okay. but there are circumstances where they can go back Further, as many as six or seven years in cases if, if they're going to allege, let's say, fraud. Uh, you know, if there's a if there's a deliberate effort to, to conceal, sometimes they, they can increase the statute of limitations, but you should assume that it'll be at least you know, on the order of three years. And so if you've got that three-year window, every you know, and you cut that off now, every day that goes by without an audit, you have liability dropping off the back end. Okay, so the answer is the answer is the talk to your tax professional. It's possible, unlikely, and no matter what, the second you change, the second you convert, if if your business is indicative of this, the second you convert, you're stopping the clock and you're showing the right effort and doing the right thing. Is that is that in a yes. nutshell? And, and, and one state? other right, and one other thought about this is that is that you would be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't be surprised, at the extent to which government agencies do not talk to each other. No, that doesn't surprise any of us. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> I, don't think so I don't think there's a single what going on. So, and I, th my, my personal opinion is that right now, the biggest risk in terms of audits is from the state unemployment agencies, because they're the ones who are developing these, these databases. Nothing, you know, nothing. So the IRS, so if, so if you change their status going forward, you know, you could argue that that might be a red flag for the IRS, but I don't think the IRS is really looking for that right now, the way the departments of employment security are looking for it. And what, and what's trick, what's going to trigger their audits is not so much what you're doing, 
as it is these claims that they're getting from, you know, if, if they see okay. 15 independent contractors have filed for unemployment, yeah. who all list you as their last employer. Right. That's your red flag. And they see that they're, and they see that they're, that they are dog walkers. Right. That's the red flag. All right, Karen Levy, was that not the best answer? Are you so thanks? I'm asking for a friend. I have I have employees. All right, that thank Karen, by the way. Good on you to make that uh, to make sure that you made that statement. Thanks, Karen. All right, Neil, I'm gonna go ahead and move back to you so I don't keep interrupting you rudely. Okay. Um, and, I'll be here in the background, you know, just hanging out. Bye. Okay. It, you know, and you know, and, and not to sell past the close here, but um, but the 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 potential liabilities. Uh, for getting this wrong are not just the obvious one, namely the, the failure to pay unemployment or the failure to withhold, uh, you know, all of which are very significant. I mean, you have a whole like, raft of potential penalties. You know, the IRS can ding you for failure to, uh, uh, to file W-2s, uh, failure to you get penalties and interest for failure to withhold. The same thing applies at the state level. You have failure to to uh, pay unemployment compensation, uh, failure to uh, provide workers' comp. You have all those levels of penalties. But then there are also some, some hidden uh, liabilities that you may not otherwise think about. For example, uh, with respect to the Fair Labor Standards Act, you know, the federal statute that, that, uh, that requires the payment of overtime and a minimum wage, uh, that doesn't apply to independent contractors. So you may not be worrying too much about, well, am I paying minimum wage? Am I meeting overtime requirements for these people? Whereas if it turns out that they are retroactively determined to have been employees, you can have a whole nother set of liability there, uh, which can be very, 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 very significant. Uh, you can have uh, penalties for, uh, you know, I don't know how many people on this call are preparing I-9 forms for their workers, whether they're employees or otherwise, but federal law requires you to have, uh, you know, immigration uh, forms under the Immigration Reform and Control Act for every single employee. It doesn't apply to independent contractors, but if these, if you get audited and it turns out these people should have been employees, you can have many, many thousands of dollars of penalties just for not having the paperwork on the immigration side. Question. Um I feel like I'm. In, I feel like I'm a law. I feel like I'm a law student right now. Like I'm just professor. I do have a law question for you. Um, so I nines. You said I want to clarify for everybody. I nines are specific to who? Ever we should. Everyone should be filing I nines, or is that only for a designated group of workers? Every employer in the United States is required to prepare an I nine. Are they? They are required to confirm the identity and authorization to work in the United States of every one of their employees, and they are required to have the requisite paperwork. And uh, if, if you ever get audited by, you know, and it doesn't, it isn't just limited to immigration audits, it, you could get audited by a state discrimination agency, state taxation agency, many of these agencies will ask for I-9s. You can get, I, I had one employer just randomly got audited by ICE, the uh, immigration, uh, uh, the, the, federal, the federal agent's arm of Homeland Security that enforces the I-9s. And the mere act of not having the paperwork, irrespective of whether they are or, or are not uh, auth authorized to work in the United States, sub will sub subject you to penalties, anywhere from 500 to several thousand dollars per person. So here's another question relatedly is if if people hadn't been filing their I-9s, W-2, W-2, 1099 aside, is there also an auditing possibility for those folks? Or is that sort of just, we'll forgive it, but going forward, you better make sure you do it. No, what, you are required to prepare the I-9 within three days of the date of hire. If you don't do it, then even if you prepare the I-9 later on, you still have liability, but you are less likely to get hit for a willful violation, obviously, if you've gone ahead in and corrected it. So what I always advise employers to do is you go in, even if you're late, you're better off having them than not having them at all, because it shows good faith, a good faith effort to comply. Okay. But you're not, but, but you're, but it, it's unlawful to backdate them. So how far back, so the other question that's coming up is how far back 
will an agency look into your employment history? Um, I know you said that there's- With respect to I-9s or just in general? With, with respect to I-9s, yeah. they would expect to see one for every single current employee. In theory, they could look at former employees, but in practice, they tend not to do that. Okay, okay. So, and then for, just to just because I know a lot of folks are worried about this because our industry, of course, has been evolving and changing and what used to be okay is not okay. And this is what we're talking about right now, of course. But re, and I know you can't make a guarantee and everything is, as you've been very clear about state by state. Um, but but this, oh, the I-9s are federal though. This so I'm, I'm going to talk about, sorry, we're going a little bit backwards to the W-2 piece because this is still coming up for everyone and, and statute of limitations. You, you commented that it's a three-year, generally a three-year statute of limitations for auditing reasons. Um, is that how, how comfortable or confident should folks feel about that? We've got one person asking that seven years ago they did it wrong. They shifted since then, but is this still something? And if this is something to be worried about, is there anything that you'd recommend that they would do to get in front of it? Or is this more of a sit back and wait and hopefully nothing will happen, but if it does, then you'll talk to your lawyer and your accountant and everything. Well, assuming that you're doing it right now. Yeah, that's, then, what, that's what the assumption that you're doing it right now and you right. have been for many, many years. Right, then, then if somebody's worried about it, my, my first suggestion would be, you know, that we would look at the, you know, whatever, at the limitations oh. period, whatever state they're in. Neil, sorry. It was a question about I-9s. I think you covered the W-2. I don't want to, it was the I-9 question and we're getting. Oh, okay. 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 And on the I-9s. We'll move they, on to that then. They, and it is also, it's also important. And, and I don't want to get too far afield here, but, but it's also important that when you have these I-9s, the law specifically says when you're allowed to, throw away I-9s for former employees. Okay. It creates a very specific time frame. And I, I always tell my clients to have a program to make sure that they throw the I-9s away like as soon as they're allowed to. Okay. Because what happens is if you if you if you keep them to the beginning of time and you get audited, in theory the government could ask to see everything you've got and you'd be obligated to turn them over and they could hit you for violations from three years ago. So basically, as soon as you can dump something, shred it, burn it, make an paper airplane, set to right. do it on, whatever. Okay. Which is actually something that I've been. This could be this could be a whole other topic they talk about. Is that I've been talking to my clients lately about developing a robust a robust document retention program. That sounds really exciting. You need to know, especially and on the employment side, and obviously on the tax side, that's hugely important. Like I just. If you haven't been, you should be talking to your CPA. How long do I keep stuff? And when when can I safely throw it away? That's equally true on the employment side, not just for I-9s, but you know, let's say you terminate somebody. How long, how long do you keep that termination notice? How long do you keep their employment application? How long do you keep payroll information? All those things. You should have a policy and on a regular basis, basis clean stuff out. Uh, so... But again, just to circle back, the reason this all becomes so significant is that if you are misclassifying people as as 1099 workers when they really should be employees, then there is a strong likelihood that you are not complying with a whole set of laws that apply to employees, but not to contractors. Another set of laws. Uh, um, you know, paid and unpaid leave laws. The FMLA probably doesn't apply to most of most of, of uh, your companies because they most of them probably have fewer than fifty people. But you know, many states have now adopted uh, specific requirements on on leave, on paid and unpaid leave, which would not apply to independent contractors. But again, if if you end up, let's say, terminating an independent contractor because they were missing time. And it turns out that that time would have been covered by one of these statutes had they been an employee, and they really should have been an employee. Well, now you have a lawsuit, and you're probably so, going to lose. So when I look back, at, so I'm looking at um, just sort of taking a quick overview of some of the documents that you share with everybody, the downloads, the this download. The, okay, the, now let, let, let me explain a couple of these things. because okay, I, Let's go let's yeah. see, because I want to okay. know what the- This misclassification alert, that's the one that you just- Wait, yeah, there we go. Yes, this one. Okay, this is 
a, just sort of a summary of basically of what I've been talking about here. It's like why you need to take this seriously and why this is particularly important now and what are your potential liabilities out there? Because somebody, for somebody who's worried about this, I mean, these are all contingent liabilities. You know, if you're thinking of selling your business, if I'm representing an, a company that's thinking of buying you, yeah. the first thing I'm going to want to know, or one of the things I'm going to want to know on the employment side is, well, what have all your practices been? Yeah. And, you know, am I buying a company that has a bunch of potential liability out there for unpaid overtime or that, for- Can't they just or, do an asset sale? If that is the case, isn't an asset sale the way to go get around that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, but, but again, we have to know how to- sure, Of course. You know, right. how, 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 you know, and and it, but it also affects the valuation of the business because if you look at at you know uh, uh, our you know our friend Rob Hendrickson kindly prepared some, Hi, some documents for us that that help sort of lay out once you get past the point of deciding okay I need to do something about this then the question is well what's it going to cost me how do I assess what it's going to cost me and how do I analyze the costs of conversion versus just basically staying where I am and crossing my fingers that I don't get sued out, you know, out of business, you know, by either the government or a, a private employee. And he does a lot of excellent in-depth analysis of, of a lot of these uh, uh, cost factors that you, that you need, that you need to take into account. Uh, for example, uh, one issue that, that, uh, companies that try to convert often run into is that if you have people who are currently 1099 contractors, they they say, well, that's fine if you start treating me as a W-2, but I don't want my paycheck to go down. So if you're going to start withholding, you oh. got to pay me more so that after withholding, I'm still making the same thing. Okay, so Neil, I'm going to read you a comment right now. This is very, this is very apropos to this, this moment. Um, this is from, I can't tell it's from because their name isn't logged, but I'll read the comment. We have acquired several dog walking companies, all of which were 1099 based. So I'm very familiar with the financial incentives for company owners to misclassify as 1099. What do you say to someone who's bringing in 150 or 150 K a year as the owner of a company that's been misclassifying labor who would be closer to a break even if they convert? In other words, there's no profit motivation. For them to make the conversion, what is your what is your opinion, or what's your what's your advice? I guess more than opinion. Okay, well, if my if my advice is to the company as opposed to the acquirer, yeah, to the company itself, my advice is Raise that, your well, your business model has a problem, right? Because what you are you are booking this revenue, so on a on a pure cash flow basis, yeah, you're let's say you're you're making a you know, you're booking, say, a $30,000 profit or whatever it is, whatever your margin is. You know, let's say if your margin is 20%, then, okay, you're, you got, you're booking a $30,000 profit on this $150,000 in gross revenue. But what you're not booking is the contingent liability. Right. And, you know, every day that you open your mail, yeah. that, you know, there's a risk uh, that you're going to have a charge, an audit, you know, a letter from the IRS or something, yeah. and and uh, that could be just and depending upon the nature of your business and how many people you're running and you know, on how long you've been doing it, that that could be just financially ruinous. So, I, so I think you are doing yourself, and I this was just to harken back to my one of my opening comments. I think you are doing yourself and everyone associated with your business a disservice by not taking a very hard look at this question and saying, well, you know, you know, you know, is it true that I literally cannot run this business with W-2 employees or is there a way to make this work and get myself out from under this giant ax that's hanging over my head every day? So I think that, um, so we're at 10 or we're, we're a little bit at our time, but Neil, you've brought up a couple of topics and I'll, I'll, I'll ask everyone to comment. Would you be, I think you would be, but I'll ask you, I'm putting you on the spot, but would you be willing to come back and talk about a couple of these sort of hotter topics that have emerged from our conversation? I, I would be more than happy to. Yeah. Um, and I think one, and I think there's one other important point that, that we haven't talked about at all. It's like, yeah, yeah that could be an entire talk in and of itself, which is, you know, we keep talking about misclassification. The question is, 
how do you know whether somebody is a, is more appropriately classified as a as a contractor or as an employee? And there are a whole raft of statutes, regulations, and common law principles that have developed over the years. And sometimes it's fairly clear cut. Sometimes it's not so clear cut. And yeah. so I've kind of taken as a as a given from the beginning of the talk that dog walkers and uh, pet sitters are more appropriately classified as W two employees. I think that you know if I you know if 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 I if I had to bet the mortgage one way or the other, I'd say yes, they 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 are employees. But again, this is a state by state. Well, obviously, you have the IRS doing one thing federally, right. but you know this is state by state, and every company is a little different in terms of the, the how it compensates people and the level of authority that people have and what their duties are. And so there may be situations where it's not quite so black and white. And so that's a situation where you just need you need to be talking to a lawyer. Someone well, who, under, who knows the area who can give you sound advice about this. So that's it. Me or the, if you already have a lawyer, whoever it is, talk to, a, talk to a lawyer with experience in this area. So, Neil, two questions then, two last questions. One is, I think, um, and I know, again, we can probably go all day, and it's you know, so you're a wealth of knowledge. And I know everyone's very appreciative of myself at the top of that list. Um, I'd love to have you come back on and maybe even do a panel of folks to talk about what best business modeling is to create a profitable pet sitting dog walking business um, in today's day and age where really we are looking hard, the agencies are really looking at tenant denied status. That would be a really great conversation that we can talk, uh, we can we can pull together. But here's a question I know is on a lot of people's minds, and I'm really glad, again, I can't see who asked this. It just says Facebook user, so I apology, my apologies to the person who asked this question, um, but I'm not able to identify you. However, this is a burning question. Can a business owner go to jail when they've been notified that they're misclassifying labor as 1099 and then continue to do so and then get caught? Theoretically, yes. Okay. Theoretically, both the both federal and state statutes provide for criminal liability wow. for, for intentional or, or fraudulent classification of employees. This is after notification. We're talking after notification. I think that's important to discuss. right. Well, that, that, that's why when I say willful, it implies that you have made Just a make conscious. Yep. You know, and the other element might be that you, if you go out of your way to somehow hide. What you're doing, you know, you pay people cash under the table, that sort of thing. So, yes, theoretically, I mean, I don't want to go overboard and saying, you know, like everyone on this call is going to be let out with their house in handcuffs if they don't if they don't do what I'm telling them to do. But you know, in addition to the liabilities we've been talking about in extreme cases, just like for a failure to to, to prepare I nines, you know, you've seen cases where, let's say, you know, they're like, you know. So, uh, there was a slaughterhouse in Arkansas where some of the corporate executives were held criminally liable for intentional for intentionally seeking out and hiring unauthorized, you know, basically, you know, undocumented workers and then failing to, to, to either do, failing to do the paperwork or doing fraudulent paperwork. So it's a practical matter. The likelihood is you're not going to be held criminally liable, but it is the potential is out there along with everything else. So, yeah, there's a lot to worry about here if you're doing it wrong. Okay, so on that really high level, on that really high note, uh, got that? There's a lot to worry about. Nothing, not that you have nothing to worry about every single minute of every single day. Like that, that's what that's what your lawyer is for. To, you know, let the, the lawyer point. worry about it for you. That's right. So this is why your lawyers are here. This is why we have these conversations. This is why you have resources. This is why you have a network. This is why you have a, a full industry that's supporting you. If you are in this position and you feel like, holy shit. I better do something. Just here, I'm gonna put Neil's information up. He'll, if he can't help you, he'll put you to someone who will. The folks that I know who have worked with Neil, including some of the NAPS people, have been very happy. I was, like I said, introduced to Neil through Rob Hendrickson, a Chicago entrepreneur, pet services entrepreneur, and I obviously have been impressed. He's provided us with so much. Neil, thank you. You've provided us with so much information. And my contact information also appears in that employer alert that. Fantastic. So either this oh, way that yeah. I, I do free consultations for people. So wants to have a brief conversation. I'm happy, happy to happy to help. But we're all, we really are all in this together. Like I'm, I'm a small business owner myself. Like I get it. You do. 
I feel like that's just such an important thing to say. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for being so um, down to earth and so relatable yeah. around around that. Because I think just and, and relentlessly positive. And relentlessly positive. This is this is going to end. This is going to be. This will get to be better very very yes. soon. Um, all right, everybody. I am thinking about you, Neil. I first want to just quickly say, not quickly, but uh, enthusiastically say thank you, and, and really just express my gratitude that you spent this time with us, and that you did all of the pre work in advance to this, and all of the downloads, everything. You've just been fabulous. I'm really super grateful. Thank you on behalf of everybody. Um, and and we'll figure out a way for you to come back sooner than later to talk about some other, maybe some more tangible next steps for right. um, for everybody else. Um, so. Thank you all for commenting and, and being thoughtful and supporting my what how we should sort of handle our Facebook coffee lives into the future. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a bit of a sabbatical um, leading up into the fourth. I'm going to do some guesty sort of surprise showings. Uh, showings. Um, this isn't real estate. Some some things where I'll show up with either a guest or myself. I'll still be here. You'll still hear from me throughout the week, but I'm not going to schedule it. I've got some, my schedule has shifted quite a bit because of summer and Sadie and just business demands that FetchFind has that I have uh, with FetchFind and PetFinder and some other things that have come up that I'm excited to share with you guys soon. Um, so yeah, so my my whole thing has sort of shifted like like yours has. So I'm here for you. I'm completely here for you all the time. I don't think that that's a surprise or a question, but I want you to know that I um, I will still be around. I'll still be doing lives. It will just be come see, come saw whenever makes sense. If you need anything from me, from my team, um, if there's anything we can do for, me, for you now or whenever, you know that you can just reach out in any way, shape, or form, email, text. Facebook message, whatever it is, Fetch Finds here for you always. Um, we want you to use our platform. We want you to use it. And I don't say this outwardly very often, if probably never, but I want you to use Fetch Find to help your employees. If they're on furlough, if they're doing just very, very part time work, use this time to get them educated. Our content is being enriched and changed and updated. If you have content that you really want to see, let us know. In the future, we're going to be developing first aid, nutrition. These are all things that are going to be happening within the next several months. And um, we're going to have some retail content available. So, if you're not, a, if you are a FetchFind subscriber, which 99.9% .9 of you are, and if you're not using the platform but you've paid for it, please, this is the time. This is really the time. You will get so much out of it. If nothing else, a cultural shift where everyone's on the same page about best practices for pet care and quality client interactions which is really what the industry needs to come together on that we are taking care of clients and we're taking care of pets at the highest possible level we believe i very much believe that fetch find is at the at the at the epicenter of knowing how to do that and what best practices are but you are in the field you are working with people you have employees or 1099s or both and you have clients or you will have clients again or whatever your status is Communicate, let us know. Again, we are here to make it that when the new normal or when things start to level out or for where they are today, there's lots and lots of resources. There are many others as practical um, that, that want to help you be successful, survive, and be better uh, than you ever were. So I'll end my speech there. All things that I haven't said for the last several months, but I'm really happy to be saying it right now. All right, so I'll see you soon. I won't be on live schedule tomorrow or throughout the rest of the week, but I will be back this week. Um, and then we'll sort of figure things out after the 4th of July holiday. All right, so I love you guys. I'm really grateful that you've been spending all of this scheduled time with me for the last several months. Neil, once again, thank you. You're fabulous. Yeah. Obviously dedicated and enthusiastic about, um, about employment law. So wait, way to go, you. Um, way to go, you. And everybody else, if you need us, uh, we are here for you. Yes, please have Neil back on. All right, people want you to come back on. We'll get you back on. Um, all right. On that note, Neil, thank you. Everybody else, thank you. Have a great day. Be safe. Have a happy Fourth of July in advance. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.